This is the StoryWorks Roundtable, where we have conversations about craft. Because becoming a successful author begins with writing a great story. Hello and welcome to tonight's StoryWorks Roundtable. Catherine and I are just thrilled to have the best-selling mystery author, Sarah Rosette, with us today. Sarah writes three different cozy mystery series. She's got 16 novels out. Publishers Weekly has called her book satisfying, well-executed, and sparkling. You can find Sarah at sarahrosette.com. We will put a link to that in the show notes. Now, tonight we're talking about plotting mysteries. And if you didn't already hear it, there's a companion episode where we talk about characters. So make sure you look for that. We'll also link to that in the show notes. Welcome, Sarah. Welcome back. (laughs) Yay. Thanks for having me. Yay. Of course. All right. So plot. I think plotting any novel is fun. I always say it's like doing a giant 3D puzzle that's full of moving parts. You know, (laughs) when you're trying to figure it out, it just kind of makes your brain crazy and with mysteries we've got all the work of plotting any novel but we also have to keep suspense in mind our clues our reveals laying everything in there very carefully not only for our detectives but also for the readers and then we want that ending to be surprising but when it's over the reader should be able to trace how we came to that and why it's inevitable with all the evidence we planted So why don't we start by talking about the elements of plot and especially anything we really need to focus on when we're writing a mystery, anything that needs that extra bit of control. (laughs) So what makes plotting a mystery special or different from plotting any other kind of book or is it not? Maybe it's not that special. (laughs) <laughs> I think that um, because you have because you have the story of the characters and their their personal journey, whatever they're going through, but then you've also got the story of the mystery, and you've got to make it you've got to weave those threads together so that when you get to the end, like you said, mm-hmm. you've got a satisfying resolution for the characters as far as whatever they've been going through. But then you've also got to be able to look back. And the reader's got to be able to say, oh, those clues were there all along. I just mm-hmm. missed them or I misinterpreted them. So I think there is some extra planning or work or else you get to the end and you go back and you drop in the clues and the red herrings or rearrange them to make them make sense. So I think right. there's like an extra layer. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. I think with any book, you've got your main plot line of the action, the through line, kind of that mm-hmm. tangible thing the book is about. And then you've got all the character arc, relationship, subplot pieces that the book is about. But then in the mystery, there's that element of keeping things hidden. You're kind of playing a game with the story where you've got to keep two stories alive in your mind simultaneously. There's the one that you know is what is actually going on with your pro- with all of your characters, you know, and then um, the one you're presenting to the reader, because you can't just show everything as it happens. You've got to kind of play hide and seek with the different plot elements so that you get the surprise at the end. Yeah, I think of it as like you've got the visible storyline of what the reader is reading, mm-hmm. and then you've got like this invisible storyline that's going on underneath, and that's the murder and what the murderer is doing to cover his tracks. And some of that may have taken place even before the book begins. Right. So a lot of times I'll have my, this is, you know, basic plot of what, what the reader will read. But then I also have to know, like sometimes I'll have two timelines. Like, okay, Mm -hmm. this is, you know, this is when the body was moved, but it's not in the story <laughs> because nobody knows, but they're going to find the body here, so it has to have happened here because mm-hmm. mystery readers are very astute and going, oh, well, he couldn't have moved the body on Tuesday night because he was at the movies with so-and-so, you know, so right. they'll pick up on things like that. So you have to keep it all straight. Mm-hmm. Definitely. And you also have to factor in 
so many pieces that are critical to this genre that aren't to others because you're developing the timeline of the actual crime you know the book i'm plotting right now for example i've got um i know a body is going to end up under ice and so <laughs> i'm thinking like okay when does it need to be discovered i thought that the wife was going to be able to declare the husband dead and take over the business but then i realized well you actually have to wait like five years before you can declare a missing person dead so his body has to be discovered you know fairly soon but is he going to be dug out of the ice is it going to be spring you know what's the rate of decay and all of those facts <laughs> yeah sorry <laughs> all of those facts that go into a mystery and like you were saying that the reader is very astute about because they consume so much of we all consume so much of our favorite genres that you can't misstep you know so that's mm -hmm. another challenge of plotting plotting a mystery yeah yeah you do have to get all the details right about like the decomposition and stuff and like mm -hmm. would there even be you know like remnants of clothes to be found if it's after a certain point in time if that's a critical clue then you've got to do research and figure out you know how fast things mm -hmm. decay and what type mm -hmm. of material it is right and if this gets thrown away would it ever be found again do i need this yes. to resurface if i need it to resurface where is it going to go how's it going to be hidden who's going to find it how much time will have passed <laughs> it's yeah it's a lot of moving parts in that puzzle yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Speaking of bodies, yes. in a mystery, at what point in the plot does your body have to show up? Like, at what point in the book, how early, how late can you push it? Like, where is that body mystery start thing happen? Well, I think that you don't want to wait too late. <laughs> right. Some people would say, you know, it needs to be by a certain page, number, or percentage point. But I mm -hmm. think you just want it early enough in the story that your readers are aware it's a mystery. Because sometimes I'll read a book and I'll start thinking, well, is this really a mystery? Mm -hmm. Has it been miscategorized? You know, because the body doesn't show up until like the halfway point or even after that sometimes. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, it is a mystery. <laughs> so people disagree <laughs> about the exact right time. Right. Yeah, I think you can look at it as... A body is found is the opening hook. I mean, that's true in a lot of traditional mysteries. Or you can open with some of your people, either your detective or some of those that cast who will become the suspects in it. But then that crime, that body has to turn up in Act One, so in the opening quarter of the book. And really, the earlier the better, because that's why readers come to a mystery is to know there's a crime to be solved so if it's not a body it's a heist or it's a whatever whatever the crime is right. the thing we need to solve that's the teaser because the reader is solving the puzzle along with the detective so you've got to present the reader with the puzzle that they get mm -hmm. to solve you know and it's of course you can have fun with different things like i um had a bodiless mystery because the crime was 40 years old, you know, but then <laughs> there are other things you play with. <laughs> but the, I open my books with a prologue that shows you some aspect of the crime. So that gives you that hook immediately. And then in chapter one, I go to my protagonist and we kind of touch base with Where's Jess? Where are the supporting characters? But but Jess has to be in touch with that crime in Act 1. So it's not like a bait and switch, you know? It's the hook, and then we're quickly involved. The protagonist has to be involved in the crime soon. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you can do something where, like, the body is missing like somebody's missing and that's mm -hmm. your hook to get you know that's the mystery but eventually it leads to either that person is dead or maybe that's just the hook to get you into the mystery and something else right. is going on right because so, mm -hmm. yeah. 
Not all mysteries need to be murder mysteries. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> many types of many types of mysteries. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it could be the mis- the mystery of the missing cat. <laughs> Yeah. You know, yeah. if that's exciting to your readers. Yeah. In my, uh, in my On the Run series, I have some of those books have murders in them, but not all of them. And some mm-hmm. of them have more to do with like theft of. I love like the art theft um, mm-hmm. heist type genre. So sometimes it'll be yeah. something like that instead of the you know, dead body. But right. like in a cozy mystery. If you don't have a body, your readers are going to be upset. <laughs> oh, so I cozies think. require bodies. I think so, yeah. Mm-hmm. I think that's, that's what people expect. Yeah. They require bodies, but no murders on screen. That's right. <laughs> no no gore, that's no right. violence, no swearing, no sex. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but death, yes. But a body, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that's partly because it's... Um, a murder is very serious and it's going to give your characters a reason to search for answers you know so mm-hmm. towards it goes towards stakes you know? mm-hmm. yeah definitely so how do we keep things surprising for the readers because you've uh, that's a key element to suspense is you've got to keep the reader uncertain of what's happening when things are predictable or formulaic then we lose some of the fun so what is the art of uh keeping the reader in suspense (laughs) how do we do that do you want to go Catherine? you look like you're poised (laughs) we're we're all just starting to open our mouths we're all about to speak at once Well, I think as a writer, if I really have to work to piece the crime together and to plant that evidence, then it's probably not obvious. You know, like if it's not easy for me, it's probably not going to be obvious when I get it on the page. You know, there's... And if it were easy for me, I wouldn't have as much satisfaction or fun in writing it. Like that idea of the first three options are probably not the options you want to take because they're too readily available. Yes. Too top of mind, therefore dig deeper, dig deeper, dig deeper, dig dig deeper until you find something that's a little more out there. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I like to, like, do different things. Like, as I'm writing, like, a lot of times my characters like the murder will happen and you know how the kind of the plot goes you like you know they make the main character makes an attempt to mm-hmm. and then fails and like so in a mystery that would be you would suspect one person or one situation think this is the answer and mm-hmm. they find out that's wrong and then you go on and they try again it's a bigger failure you know and it builds mm-hmm. to the end till they finally get it right and so you know i kind of followed that pot- pattern for a couple of books and i thought one time i thought well what if I have her suspect one person and he's cleared Mm -hmm. and she goes on and on and on. But then it turns out that he really is the murderer. So she has to go back and, you know, so things like that keep me interested. And I was like, okay, so if it's interesting to me, I hope that, you know, it's (laughs) uh, it's new and interesting to a reader too. Mm -hmm. Or to do things like, you know, the, maybe the situation is just different. Like I had one mystery when we lived in Georgia, I was reading this newspaper about we had these floods in this old Civil War cemetery had uh-huh. flooded and a bunch of the caskets had opened. And I, you know, mystery oh, wow. writer, I right. was like, ooh, I can't Perfect. Use this. <laughs> so I thought, well, what if there's that one of those opens and they find that there's not one body there, but two? Like there's an mm-hmm. older body and a newer one, you know, so right. things like that. I'm like, that kind of keeps me going because it's a little bit different it's not like here's your cast of characters this person's dead okay one of these people Mm -hmm. did it you know I kind of like to just vary it up a little bit right right yeah and I think as we work on our surprises 
We also have to always keep plausibility in mind and verisimilitude. You know, so as we're thinking of this great premise, like a civil war grave that has a fresh body in it, you know, then we have to start thinking, how did the body get there? Who put it there? How long has it been there? And looking at that community in our cast of characters, who's got motive? Why would it be there? What was this person doing when? Who, you know, and that, um, I think when you set up plausibility for somebody being clear or guilty, depending on if they're the villain or the red herring, you know, and then you get to the twist and the truth is just as plausible as the misdirect, that's probably where surprise comes in, you know, because if it's not believable, then then that story is out the window for us. We aren't going to buy into the story anymore. Right. You know. I think, the tw- I think finding the twists are the mm-hmm. hardest part of plotting because you want it to be something that your reader goes, oh, that's interesting, and I didn't see that. Mm-hmm. But you want them to go be, think, oh, that could have happened, or that's logical or plausible. So yes. that's something that, that um, I yeah. try and figure those out before I get to, before I actually start, I try and know like big changes that are going to happen in the story, the big mm-hmm. plot twist. Yeah. Do you have a, for instance, from one of your books of a twist that you, that you worked through? Well, um, one, I can tell you that it didn't turn out the way I thought it would. Uh-huh. So sometimes those are the best stories. And <laughs> um, I had this character that I thought he was going to be the one of the bad guys. Like maybe he wasn't the murderer but he was involved somehow and in this story he's following the main character around and doing all these things that seem really suspicious and I was in the middle of writing a scene with him and all of a sudden I realized oh my goodness he's not the bad guy he's an undercover FBI agent oh cool he's, you know he's invested in getting this whole like she's involved in this what she thinks is a little local mystery mm-hmm. but it's got all these other layers to it and so Right. And see, that just came out of nowhere. I don't know where that came from. But to me, I was like, oh, I didn't see that coming. Mm-hmm. But it makes the story more interesting. So yeah, you know, if only I could think of those things before and know what was coming. Right, <laughs> so, right. <laughs> and then you say, oh, and now I have to go learn all about undercover <laughs> FBI agents and how they work. <laughs> yes. We're right. Yeah. Yay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Research is part of the fun of it, though. I think it's, I think you have to love research to write a book on anything, except maybe a memoir, could, you know? <laughs> and I could get lost in research for days. So I have to limit myself. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Now, I write books in which the reader knows who the killer is. So the mystery is about how it was done and how Jess is going to get there and what kind of danger Jess is in. Are all of your mysteries the kind where the reader's trying to figure out who the killer is or who the thief or whatever is? Yes, mine are all structured where you you find all that out at the end. So you don't ever get the perspective, the point of view of the killer. So. Mm -hmm. He's just Mm -hmm. one of those normal characters, just the neighbor or somebody who works at the grocery store or something, you know, so it's it's a different, it would be a different type of plotting than what you're doing, I think. Yeah, it would be. I need to, I guess, you know, on my end, I know who did what before I start Mm -hmm. writing, you know, Mm -hmm. but then for the reader, it's not a matter of hiding the killer's identity but it's a matter of making the how and the what and the when interesting and using the antagonist point of view to get into that psyche not to reveal things i never use that point of view to show the reader what the killer's doing i use Mm -hmm. it to show the reader how the killer's thinking because that's the piece that interests me is what kind of person does this you know. Mm-hmm. So you give them the why first? The why mm-hmm. the killer did the killing? 
Yeah, yeah, the why or pieces of the why, I guess that's the puzzle. Part of the puzzle is why is this happening, not right. who is doing this. You know, in the first Skog Hall, the killer is a Vietnam veteran with PTSD. So in the prologue, he's stalking the victim. He's spying on her from her yard and, you know, it's night. So he's watching her through the window and he's having some flashbacks to the war that are very violent. And so we know right away this is someone with issues and what he sees in front of him isn't real, you know, but then when we're in the victim's point of view, she's interacting with him, she knows him, he was her high school sweetheart, but then it's very unsettling because the reader knows something she doesn't. She doesn't know how crazy he is. She just knows he's back and he's not right, you know, so I work my plot to unsettle the reader, to keep the reader, the tension up and the stakes up. But I'm using the fact that the reader knows something the characters don't to do that. So that would really heighten the suspense because your reader sees both and mm-hmm. can see that your main character is not in a good situation. So that makes it more edge of your seat, I think. Yeah, I hope so. That's the <laughs> <laughs> that's the goal is to keep the reader on on the edge of his seat. Um, yeah, you know, there's an example I was just writing about where the killer is stalking Jess, my protagonist, in the second book, not the Vietnam veteran book. And so the reader knows she's being followed, but she doesn't know she's being followed. So the idea is that the reader will get nervous for Jess and have that tension because of the disconnect between what the reader knows and what Jess knows. But then when I go into the killer's point of view, he doesn't tell the reader, I'm going to follow her home and I'm going to wait for this and then I'm going to do that. You know, he actually goes into a flashback. So while he's sitting there waiting for Jess to come out of a store or whatever, the scene is used to show us more of his psyche and more of what made him who he is. Because to me, I think that's way more interesting than the stalking piece. That piece is really obvious to the plot. Yeah, a guy's following her. We get it. That's bad. <laughs> you know, so hopefully the reader feels that way as well. I think in the types of mysteries that I'm writing, the cozy, more cozy mystery, that's a harder um element to Mm -hmm. give to the reader because most of them are first person so you have your protagonist point of view and you know gradually she's going to find out little bits and pieces that will add up to the answer to the mystery Mm -hmm. and you know she'll find out certain things about personality and history but it's hard to give that reason why or why this person did that unless you have like Mm-hmm. Like a diary, or yeah. you've got somebody that you know knew them really well. So that's just like a kind of a more difficult aspect of mm-hmm. the first person. Yeah. So in cozies, then, do you think the motives have more to do with tangible things like money or lust or greed? You know, greed or whatever, as opposed to kind of yeah. like I was dealing with psychosis, basically, yeah. <laughs> which is. Um, yeah, I think, harder to get into, you know. Yeah, I think that um, in a cozy, uh, uh, readers want to have like a logical explanation for why the crime was committed. So, like it was for the insurance money, or it was to gain, you know, control of this business, or something like that. Um, mm-hmm. You can use like revenge as a motive, but I think that's much harder to make believable because mm. I think that you have to really like Agatha Christie used that in um, Murder on the Orient Express uh-huh. that the people well they were getting justice but it's like right. it, the crime was so horrible and it affected so many people that I think it's harder to um, make that a motivation mm-hmm. because it's just to me it's more difficult as a writer to make it believable that somebody 
would kill somebody out of revenge. Whereas if they know they're getting a monetary benefit or something, or right. they're getting access, maybe they love somebody and they kill the spouse so they can be together. I think those are more believable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Revenge would definitely be a little darker. <laughs> <laughs> yes. A little, a little deeper. Hmm. Now, how does technology factor into your plots? All of your stories are current day, right? Mm -hmm. I know when cell phones became so prevalent, some writers were setting stories back a few years just so they didn't Mm -hmm. have to deal with that because you, you know, and especially in the mystery genre, we need victims and we need our heroes to be threatened fairly often. And so... (laughs) you know, oh, darn, I forgot to charge my cell phone, <laughs> right? It wears thin after yeah. after so many books. So are your characters tech savvy? Do you incorporate it into your stories at all? Or is that kind of outside yeah. the parameters of cozy where people just don't care about that piece of no. it? I go ahead and I use cell phones and social media and stuff like that because I figure that's just part of our lives. And if it wasn't in there, people would be like, well, why is why isn't doesn't she just call the police you know from her car or whatever so i think you have to you can you can get away with the i forgot to charge my cell phone or there's no coverage here Mm -hmm. a few times but Mm -hmm. not every time you know and that is a challenge with writing a mystery is you have to get your character into a situation where i think in the end your readers want to see that confrontation Mm -hmm. between the main character and the antagonist and it can't be, you know, your character just turns all the evidence into the police and says, there you go. You know, they want right. that conflict. Mm-hmm. So you have to get them into a position where that can happen. And sometimes that takes a lot of manipulation, setting. right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yes. no, it does. Absolutely. And that goes back to having an active protagonist. And also in the other episode, you mentioned the willing suspension of disbelief that... Yes. that our readers bring to the table and it's so important on our end to keep things plausible and focus on verisimilitude but one of the challenges of the genre is manipulating all of these moving parts so that at the end we can have that satisfying climax you know like I had to get a boyfriend out of town so that my so Jess could go meet the antagonist <laughs> alone. Yes. And I actually really lucked out because I said um, my stories are in a fictional version of a real village in mm-hmm. Wisconsin that is on the Mississippi River, so it's surrounded by bluffs. And when I was interviewing the county sheriff, I was like, I need her to do this alone, but she would just call the sheriff she would just like you know how am i going to get around this and he said oh it's the bluffs cell signals just bounce around we miss calls all the time i was like yeah (laughs) total dumb luck (laughs) yes yep so then i made sure my sheriff mentioned that at one point in Mm -hmm. conversation to jess i was like okay (laughs) we laid it in there Mm -hmm. sometimes i've done things where like i would get so frustrated because I was like, I need this confrontation, but I don't want her to be stupid. Right. And so a lot of times I would have her make the final discovery, figure out the final thing, Mm -hmm. like when she's in the presence of the person who did it, like maybe Mm -hmm. she's at a party or in a restaurant and he's like right there or she's like right there. And so somehow you've got to get them in that situation where they have to be where they have to, get through that confrontation mm-hmm. before they can call the police or maybe they call the police and they can't make it right away because you know mm-hmm. bad weather like, I don't know but you know like right. you have to think through these things because otherwise you know most people would not be in that situation so you have to work it where mm-hmm. they can they can be there yes yeah you do and sometimes it's just fun. You mentioned bad weather. <laughs> and I did have a lightning storm at my climax in book one. And I was like, is this cliche? Well, I don't care because it's just fun yeah. and it sets the mood yeah. and it works really well for this story. And I can't do that in book two, but but this one is fun. <laughs> or perhaps, you know, they 
contact the police and turn the information over. But mm-hmm. I had a book one time where, like, of course, the everything comes together at the most critical moment that she's finds out what's wrong. But the police, there's been a whole subplot in the book that there's like this drug smuggling ring mm-hmm. going on in the town, and the police are a small county police department, yeah. sheriff's department is kind of stretched thin, and they're mm-hmm. in the middle of a sting to bring down, and so they can't get there right away. Um, right. So that was something that I'd read about in the paper that they'd run this big sting, and I was like, well, what if that went on at the same time this happened? You know, yes. it might cause it 15 minutes for them longer for them to mm-hmm. get there. Mm-hmm. Now, do you keep a Bible or a manual for each series so that as you're getting into the double digits or <laughs> are you like okay i have used this device i have used this mm-hmm. setting are you tracking all of that for yourself no. No, yeah. <laughs> i should <laughs> i should but um i didn't start out that way and now the thought of going back and documenting it all is a little mm-hmm. overwhelming so mm-hmm. there are um i've seen author assistants do it yeah that's just one of their services they're like They'll make you a Bible and they'll tell you like everybody's hair color and eye color and yes. all the different, so mm-hmm. that might be an option. Yeah. yeah, I have those pages in Scrivener, but I'm not that organized. <laughs> so, <laughs> so right now my my Bible's a little haphazard. <laughs> but, I do have a character <laughs> list. Yeah, I saw um, an author talk with A.S. Byatt and she said, she kept a journal and she wrote all of her stuff as she was writing in this journal. And then she she had enough money to hire a personal assistant who then went through her journals and created an index for her journals so that if she wanted to look up something about one of her books, she had this index somebody else took the time to create and she could just go find it. And then she made this comment that now we have computers and it's so much easier because you've got the find, <laughs> the find feature. Yes. But I think she was still having an assistant do the actual <laughs> <laughs> finding and indexing. It's like, ooh, put that on my wish list. Somebody yeah. to index for me. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. I use the find feature a lot. I do mm-hmm. have a list of characters and their descriptions and kind of, you know, place names and things like that Mm -hmm. it's not it's not as detailed as it could be that's for sure yeah same here (laughs) (laughs) well this has just been so much fun do either of you have any final thoughts or questions about plotting mysteries all right well this has been storyworks roundtable thank you everybody for joining us and please find sarah at sarahrosette.com s-a-r-a R-O-S-E-T-T and we will link to it in the show notes. Thank you for listening to the StoryWorks Roundtable. Find all our shows, show notes, and videos at storyworkspodcast.com.